He's John Timpain. And he's Don Rooney. And this is The Musical Inner Tube. Now you may ask, why is this podcast called The Musical Inner Tube? And we may reply, because that's its name, of course. Now, how did this podcast get that name? Back in college, we hosted a radio show. Once, we tried to introduce a soothing musical interlude. Instead, we messed up and wound up introducing a soothing musical inner tube. And the name stuck. So here we are, hundreds of years later, still talking. Talking to interesting people about their interesting lives. Difference makers who really make a difference. It's one of the most celebrated unsolved murders in Philadelphia history. In February 1957, the body of a little boy was discovered in a J.C. Penney bassinet box in a weedy lot in Fox Chase, a suburb of Philadelphia. Investigators said the child died from blunt force trauma, and for six decades, he was known simply as the boy in the box. In December, the Philadelphia Police Department finally was able to announce the name of the boy in the box, Joseph A. Zanelli. They also announced that, thanks to contract investigators, genealogists, and DNA technology, they had determined who the mother and father were, but did not release their names. Here to help us understand all that is our guest today on the musical inner tube, Catherine Ramsland. She is an expert on many things, including crime scene investigation, forensic technology, a cold case sleuthing, serial killers, mass murders, vampires, sex offenders, ghosts. Catherine has written more than 60 books and a 1,000 articles and has participated in many crime investigations. Welcome again, Catherine. Well, it's great to be back here with you guys. I'm, I'm very happy you invited me. So, Catherine, let's just start from the emotional standpoint and the administrative standpoint of all this. I mean, there was a lot of excitement around the announcement a couple of weeks ago uh, about finding the name of this child. And it's really, that's what they were announcing, that they were finding the name of this person. They did not release the mother's or father's names. Uh, There were all sorts of legal things. Uh, They'd known, someone had known the name of this child for about a year. But the police department was, uh, had some legal hurdles to overcome before they could uh, announce it, uh, announce the name. And they also said, you know, we probably will never make an arrest in this case. So talk about why the excitement was so palpable in the room and why this case has been, I think, some, one of the most written about cold cases in, our, in the city's history. Well, uh, I think the emotion came from the fact that it wasn't just the boy in the box. It was America's unknown child. And that was the VDOC Society's um, new name for it since 1998, which, made, which really expanded a sense of uh, people caring about what happens. And it was Man. it was such a, a nasty kind of incident where they find this four-year-old boy just discarded like trash in a trashy place. Um, he obviously has suffered. He'd been beaten. He had bruises. He had some surgical scars um, and no identification. So it was clear that somebody just um, w- just wanted to dump him and didn't want him ever to be known. And so the callousness of that, I think, really got to people. And then uh, America's Most Wanted took up the case uh, late, later on in the uh, 1990s. And because they broadcast it, that became, uh, you know, all over the all country. And also, even at the time when they were in the 1950s, when they're trying to drum up leads, they had put posters out, people remembered people in Philadelphia remembered these posters hanging in grocery stores of this uh, this boy's face and um, they even had made a poster where they dressed the body and put that out there and that right. was you know kind of graphic and but it imprinted on people's memory and so the idea that this many years 65 years later we can identify somebody is not just about this case it's about Oh, how many more can we do? Because there are so many John Doe's and Jane Doe's out there. What can, is this technology going to help us identify others? So I think it has far ranging repercussions more so than just this particular case. But the fact that this case, you know, has a head, a large headstone, people can visit the grave. They can read about the story there. A website was devoted to it for a long time. There were yeah. chat groups there. Um, you know, it, it just became kind of a, a symbol of these cold cases that really need to be solved for it doesn't it's not even about who killed him. 
It's about him getting his identity. And I think a lot of people relate to the idea that a, that this kid just shouldn't be some anonymous person that nobody knows what connections he has to Philadelphia. So I think there's a lot of things going on with that case. Absolutely. Uh, I know that uh, we should probably tell our our listeners a, a little tiny bit about the Vidoc Society, that this is this is a local it's 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 near uh, Philadelphia and it's it's about people who do cold cases, people who uh, do um, DNA sleuthing. Um, uh, I know well, you know much more about it. More, yeah. It's more formal than that because I've been to a yeah. number of their meetings. So let me, yes. let me just say you say something about Vidoc. Um, sure. That was a French detective who had innovated a number of uh, investigative features back in the 19th century. He he actually wrote, even though Edgar Allan Poe is credited with the first uh, detective novel, actually Vidoc beat him. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's not well known. I've written about it, but it's not well known. But they, they called themselves the Vidoc Society, um, and it's really retired investigators. Uh, there are FBI agents involved. There are U.S. Marshals involved. There are a lot of uh, pol- police officers, detectives involved. And uh, many of them have retired, but they want to keep sleuthing. And they have the skills and they have the connections and, and whatnot. So they have these luncheons once a month where they bring in people who have cases that have not been solved. Sometimes it's family members. Sometimes it's a police officer who it's haunted by the case and he has a lot of stuff to show them. And they brainstorm it. So there, there's a, a very formalized crowdsourcing of, of professionals. And sometimes, like I've been invited a few times because I wrote for their newsletter, so I got in as a guest. But um, mostly it's, it's people who have been formerly in some kind of investigative role, and they're the ones who, who do this. Um, it's, it's a really amazing organization re- uh, that Philadelphia hosts. I know that um, uh, you talked about cases haunting people i certainly you know i was at the philadelphia inquirer for more than 20 years and the case came to haunt me whenever we revisited it uh which we did from time to time and i saw that one of the head guys for the vdoc society said after a while i came to think of this boy as my son and i know exactly what he thought uh, he meant because i i sort of began to feel personally responsible and and in you know, I began to think about the, the time when maybe they'll know more about him. And of course, I didn't didn't know anything about this human being except for the, the the terrible details of his finding. But that's sort of what made this go, isn't it? In as yeah, as a I, as a public cause. Yeah, and, and I, that was uh, Bill Fleischer, I believe, who said that. Yeah. Um, only yes. he's the only re- of the three founding members. He's the only one remaining, and um, it meant that case meant a lot to him. He even said too that. He doesn't cry much, but the day they named him, he and his wife both cried over this case because it was like their own. And they also, the VDOC Society uh, went to the potter's field to exhume the remains of the boy in uh, 1998 to get some DNA because at that time there was some DNA technology, but they but the remains are pretty degraded. So they ended up extracting mitochondrial DNA from the tooth. And then decided we're not just going to put him back in this potter's field, which is, you know, basically a place that people go when no one claims them. This boy had been claimed by the VDOC Society. So they then said, let's put him in a much better place. And so then they found um, a, a lovely little cemetery. Wow. Uh, is it called Ivy Hill Cemetery? I think it is. Uh, and, and put up a large stone so that people could visit it. People could talk about it and, you know, cl- feel that same connectedness that yeah. the VDOC society felt. And it that generated a lot of interest. But their loving care of this child and also the police officers, the detectives who had spent decades uh, keep keeping what what new technology can we put to this? What new leads can we run down? What what can we do to keep this case alive? And they all wanted to solve it before they died. And and I think that's that's something that we we love that notion of this intrepid investigator just never gives up and eventually one day something occurs and uh there it is we 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 got it and, is and this, i think a lot of us identify with that kind of thing and they and they, we have a whole society of of people <laughs> who who were that yeah. way and 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 because of that 
this child was cared for for the past 65 years. Now, the the DNA um, that was used to uh, make uh, his identity w- was pretty complicated. As you said, his his bones and his DNA had degraded. And I remember reading an article talking to one of the people who worked on it who said they basically reconstructed his DNA molecule in order to get that uh, identity back. Um, so this this was not something that was easy, but you're right, something that was dogged also on the part of the scientists trying to put this back together. Well, you know, you know, when they put this on a TV show, it's going to come out through some machine in about five seconds. But actually, it took, yes. it took her two and a half years working with several international agencies to reconstruct, because what they had had was a partial um, DNA, and it wasn't good enough in 1998 for the technology we had. And, but as technology has improved and and sped up, I guess, um, they made another shot at it, which is exactly what cold case people do. They just they just stay with it. They they persist. And she did. She and she talks about um, how long it took her and how involved it was just to get the profile they could put into one of the DNA databases, the genealogical databases. Now they they also said that they. Um, were able to uh, do some cross matching and, and track down the family because other family members, extended family members like cousins and that sort of thing, had voluntarily gone to places like uh, Ancestry just you know on that that whim to find out a little bit more about their background. And uh, I don't think they could use Ancestry, but there's that other one, uh, G. Yeah, GED uh, match. GED and, match. Uh, yeah, there's a couple that, that of them. Officials, can use, uh, uh, officials can't use Ancestry, but they can use GED match. Right. And so they were able to, through the the curiosity of the extended family, they were able to use that DNA and go backwards and trace his identity that way. So that was something that was right. almost fortuitous in the in the sense that his family his family's curiosity kind of helped lead to his identity. Well, and that actually came first from public record searches because through the the genealogical database and the way they do that is to they put the profile in, they can work back to um, find a what what's you know a list of people who have some shared components, and then they shorten that list by removing some that clearly aren't aren't involved with this. They go back to find a common ancestor. And through all of that, they managed to get through public records a birth certificate. Um, when they had the birth certificate, then they then had the name of the father on the birth certificate, not the mother, but the father. So that was helpful in finding some of the family members. And then from there, they were able to collect a lot more uh, DNA and, inf- and other family information to make a, a confirmed identification. It's so amazing that what we're talking about are are things that well, didn't weren't around twenty years ago, right? And and uh, uh, I'm thinking especially well, both uh, both of something like uh, GED Match, which has just gotten uh, bigger and stronger as as time has gone by, as it's gotten used more, but also uh, it, as we've been talking about the uh, is sort of uh, stitching DNA molecules back together. I know they've made a lot of leaps and bounds of progress in uh, mastodon research trying to get the mastodon um, molecule together and the uh, the japanese scientists working on it saying oh yeah we're really close of course they've been saying that for 10 years but still you and can that's do that still now pretty, pretty fast yeah that is pretty good <laughs> yeah yeah that's... i mean pretty soon we'll have jurassic park all over again <laughs> <laughs> can't wait <laughs> that you just gotta love progress you know um and i'm thinking uh going back to your point about where this can lead. I know that Philadelphia has upward of like 226 unidentified bodies, right? Unidentified cold case murders, at least, that possibly you, you could use this same thing on. So are we going, are we going to have this big heyday of this kind of research? Is that one of the legacies of, of uh, the boy in the box case? It's already happening Almost every week you're seeing cases solved, missing people identified, wrongly identified people, re-identified in the right way. Um, 
murderers who thought they had gotten a, a rapist who thought they'd gotten away with it 30 years ago and now being arrested and brought in. It's already happening and it's happening rapidly. And there are uh, cold case organizations. Um, I, I want to point out a book for your readers just in case they don't know about this. this is such a Please cool book do. called The Skeleton Crew by Deborah Halber. How Amateur Sleuths Are Solving America's Coldest Cases. It was it was uh, published in 2014, but it's really the precursor to everything that we're seeing now, because now we have a lot of more formalized cold case uh, foundations, um, the American uh, Investigative Society of Cold Cases. I mean, there's all, all these organizations now that are bringing together talent to reapproach many of these cases. But I should really point out, and I think it's important, it's not all the ancestry genealogical databases that police are using. And that became a big deal about privacy concerns and people giving permission and whatnot. So there are two uh, that I know of, maybe there's more now, but um, the JED match, DED match, and uh, family history DNA is another one that explicitly allow law enforcement to use them. And of course, they're going to be limited to those people who uh, agree to put their DNA into that database, um, knowing that police can uh, get access to it. So that that's an ongoing debate, and you know that could take up a whole bunch of time to talk about. But it's basically, I think people need to know just because they uploaded their DNA to 23andMe or Ancestry or something, that doesn't mean that police are are accessing it. They're not, uh, but. Um, so that's the first thing to know. The second thing is uh, the fact that we are actually doing a lot of identifications now. Of you know, going back into the 1950s, we are uh, linking many of these missing people to known offenders. Um, we are, uh, and also the crucial thing was, can this be used in court? So we've had some test cases that now have allowed this methodology to be used in court. You know, the most famous case was one of the earliest ones, the Golden State Killer, um, Joseph D'Angelo, where they had a, they didn't know that this was going to work, but it was an interesting avenue to take uh, and were able to identify him as the, the rapist and murderer um, and probable break-in artist of three different California-based uh, crime sprees over a, a long period of time and he had gotten away with it for a long long time and he was arrested and the dna matched so uh, that was a good test case and then some went to court it got through all of that now opens doors for identifications and solving crimes and it's amazing we'll return to our show in just a moment but first here's a soothing musical interlude Our guest, Catherine Ramsland, is an expert on many things, including crime scene investigation, psychological sleuthing, serial killers and mass murders, vampires, sex offenders, ghosts, and of course, the writing process. Catherine has written more than 60 books and 1,000 articles, has participated in many crime investigations, and is a blogger at Psychology Today and a frequent guest in the television world including her recent work as executive producer on Roku TV's Murder House Flip. Her most recent fiction book is The Ice Cream Man, a Nutcracker Investigation, which is available at all good book venues. Now, some of the books and movies that were mentioned on this podcast episode include Crime Scene, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel, a documentary on Netflix, Don't F with Cats, Hunting an Internet Killer, also on Netflix, the Skeleton Crew by Deborah Halber, and finally, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. For more on Catherine, follow her on Facebook at facebook.com slash cat.ramsland, R-A-M-S-L-A-N-D, or follow her on Twitter at at catramsland. And now we return you to the musical inner tube, already in progress. I want to go back to something that you were talking about just a couple of uh, minutes ago about um, how the uh, amateur sleuths are going in on this because there was an article in the Inquirer uh, as a follow-up to this about how when his name was released, when the child's name was released, a lot of people were on Facebook 
Uh, and there was even some report from the family of getting some harassment from people who who were a little over eager in in their efforts to try to solve. Uh, now that we have the boy's identity, who actually killed him? Which family member was responsible? Even though both parents are have since deceased, so so you you have that layer of it in there too, where maybe some people who have nothing to do with the case but just are amateurs are are getting in there and maybe causing a little bit of an uproar. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. We have a I'm lot gonna, of that going on. There, there's definitely two sides to this coin. Um, we're grateful to a- amateur sleuths who stuck with it and really persisted and solved some some cases, you know, it, it, wonderfully. So we're we're very grateful to that. And as a result, we have a lot more uh, technology and networks and things like that to call on resources. So that's good. The bad part is some of the people who think they know what they're doing and don't know what they're doing, um, they make they lay claim to a case. It's their territory. I own this, and nobody else gets in on this. So you, you're seeing that kind of thing. One of the best um, documentaries to see how this happens is the uh, a crime scene, the C- the Cecil Hotel, uh, where they got way over the top on who they d- decided had murdered this missing woman, and and uh, they identified obviously somebody was innocent because nobody murdered her. Uh, and that guy got harassed to the point where he was suicidal. And we do have that part of, of all of this. We get harassment. We get death threats. We get um, even people visiting crime scenes and messing things up. Um, and that's something that the detectives have to deal with is all these these people calling in leads that really are, are wasting resources, wasting time. And one of the things that I talk about um, in my classes, when I teach some of this, is the cognitive errors that come from these kinds of weird biases, one of which is the idea that if they can make a logical case that sounds good, it's true. And that is not true, <laughs> because logic is simply a tool for organizing your thinking. It is You fill it with false stuff, and you're still going to come out with, the, with false conclusions. But they don't get that, because logic when it's when you line everything up feels good so they think that confirms that it's true and there's this amazing cognitive error that i i wish somebody would have would name it better but it's called it's wizziati have john right. have you heard of this one i love what this. i see is what there is yes what, what, yeah. what i see is all there is is all there and, is right and yeah what i yeah what you see is all there is the idea that we have all the facts so we can put the puzzle together and if the puzzle is put together the way it feels good, uh, it's the truth. And that's wrong because one single fact can change the entire edifice of the way they put that together. And it's one they don't yet know. And we've had multiple cases like that. Even now, we're looking back on some of the older narratives and finding out, oh, those older narratives were limited. They're not necessarily the whole truth. And now we're making new discoveries. And we have to change those narratives. And you're having people resist that because they like the completion of the old narrative. No second guessing here. And so it, it becomes a problem. And especially if people really believe they know better than anybody else. But now look, you know, we had this, this amazing case um, out of Canada with some amateur sleuths. Um, again, another documentary, Don't F with Cats. What they did was far beyond what the police could have ever done because they brought in uh, resources from their own backgrounds in data analysis and being able to track people online and whatnot. And they stuck with it. They stuck with it. And great case, great case. But that is so rare. It's so rare that somebody can do that. But the problem is now all uh, uh, probably all of these amateur sleuths think they can do that. And as a result, they're harassing people. They want this case closed. I mean, we just saw it with the the Delhi, uh, Delphi murders, the two girls that were on the bridge. Well, the the uh, police decided they were only going to say we have made an arrest, and that's all. And oh my God, did you ever get multiple multiple theories about all oh, we? He must be linked to this case too, and he must be that and that and that. And and it's not helpful. 
it's not helpful, but it's still, it is a human desire to have the complete picture because our minds don't like, our brains don't like ambiguity. They don't like holes. They want to fill in those holes and they want to do it now thanks to social media and, you know, and the internet. They, we love this, this instant gratification of knowing how our stories end. And if people aren't doing it that they think should be doing it or should have already done it, those people are going to get harassed until they produce the information. Yeah, I mean, we we have, as Don mentions, we have uh, instances of people deciding that someone is guilty and doxing them. And what that means is doing a deep dive and discovering everything they can discover about the person's past life and 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 really making their lives an open book to the public in a very unfair way, especially when the person hasn't done anything. Right. Uh, and also going back and trying to falsify things like pictures and ah. documents to fit the narrative that these folks have concocted in their heads. So, I mean, we're, we're talking about the, the far edges now, but it really does conform uh, to the Wiziati profile. By the way, if I can recommend a book, Thinking Fast and Slow by yes. Daniel Kahneman is, is sort of the Bible of, of this kind of thing because he sort of wants people to understand just what you said, Kathy, which is that logic is a tool. The existence of logical connections or seeming logical connections does not necessarily mean something's right. Uh, you right. pointed out the two reasons why. First of all, we may not know everything and we never know what we don't know. And right. uh, so that's a really important thing is that something new may come down the pike and any scientist can tell you this, you know, a theory might be right until something comes down the pike and you realize, oh, it can't be right. And, uh, and of course, we end up uh, with all the uh, detective shows where uh, some, you know, firebrand policeman or detective decides someone's guilty. And so right. half the show is unraveling that prejudicial case. <laughs> yeah, but you know. it's, it's always made to look like he's he's a singularity when in fact he's not and he or she and we have the whole psychology of need for closure in here of people who want answers right now and that's becoming more and more oppressive in our ability to really pe carefully piece together these crimes let's let's also go back to something you said earlier Catherine, and that is on the tv show this woman's two or three years worth of DNA work is going to go by in about two minutes. I remember working in television <laughs> for years and working in TV news at the same time CSI was a big deal. And a lot of uh, prosecutors and policemen were saying, people were coming to crime scenes and saying, don't you have all the evidence right here? Can't we take them to court now and get them, you know, convicted? Because that's how it happened on CSI. And that is not also reality. We can't just go and get a bunch of uh, DNA from a crime scene and make a, an arrest and a conviction within 10 minutes. This doesn't and happen. Right? Most crime scenes don't even have it. So, <laughs> yeah. But, but, but people who get on juries think so. And they think they can figure things out because they watch some TV shows and it's become a problem. I think that the boy in the box. By the way, there's a girl in the box now. I, I wanted to mention that is now there's a campaign to to solve her, at least the mystery of her identity. Uh, she has a lot of the same elements that the boy in the box have, and I hope that they find her name too. Um, I think the boy in the box, it, it, the discoveries, of, I mean, the, well, the announcements of the last couple of weeks is breathtaking. I mean, in and of itself, it is, uh, it, yes, the story, the, the case is not cracked in the sense of finding out who did it and perhaps will never be where a lot of many of the people who were in a position to kill this kid have departed this uh, earthly plane. And so, you know, we may never know, but, but the thing is to just find out his name and what went into it, as we've been discussing in and of itself, despite the open-endedness of it still is amazing just in and of itself. I agree. And also it opened up other cases that, like the carnival people who, who killed five of their children and discarded them in various states. And, uh, and the woman with the supposed memories of her parents buying a kid for a sex toy. And, you know, so we had that uh, as part of this case for a long time. We, uh, I remember Fleischer talking about, you know, that's our best lead so far. And it was. 
um, it was pretty good. She had a lot of details in her memory that had come be supposedly, according to the psychiatrist, before websites and whatnot were were posted. So who was that she was talking about? His name was Jonathan. Whatever happened to him and et cetera. So this this has opened up other uh, kinds of uh, avenues for people to travel down and and maybe get some more names. What about the fact that really, although we know the name of this child and uh, we've accomplished that, uh, the identity, but there's still a backstory uh, and the police may never be able to, to fill in who done it. Uh, yeah. th- is that something that is going to now hang over this case? Although we know who he is, we don't know how he died. We don't know who did it. So the case isn't really closed, isn't really complete. Is that going to tick some people off, basically? Well, it'll upset people because people, first of all, they love puzzles, but only if they know they can get all the pieces to get in place and they can see the end result. So people will want that. But it, it, what the destiny of this case is the same as hundreds thousands of other cases that we will never know, even if we can supply a name, we we may not ever know what happened to that person. And so it's not just about this one case, it's that we are limited. DNA does not uh, cast a spotlight on all the events in the background of this person. Uh, so it's possible. 65 years is a long time, um, but he isn't the only one. I think we have to always keep that in mind that we're, we're spending so much attention on uh, one boy, and certainly he deserves this, but wow, there are, are so many others that had did not get these resources, did not get a whole organization to adopt him. And, you know, and so what of them? I think that, that we have to keep that in mind as well. Okay. And, and one other thing, we've got to give this to you. Uh, again, plug the book that we were just talking about a few weeks ago, uh, that you have out now that's that's a cracking good mystery in and of itself. Well, right. Ice Cream Man is about missing kids and trying to solve some of these cases and figure out what happened to them. So in, in a way, it's very relevant. That was That's Ice Cream Man. Uh, and uh, how do we do the ice cream, Catherine? Ice Cream Man. <laughs> <laughs> well, Catherine Ramsland... You've done it again. You've made a half an hour seem like two minutes. It's been it's been rock'em sock'em every moment of the way. You've taken us down so many interesting pathways, and I mean that's your job, <laughs> and you do it well. And we're very we're very glad that you came back on with us at such because we just had you on a couple of weeks ago, right? Uh, but this really cried out for your expertise, and we really thank you for uh, bringing it to the musical inner tube. Well, I'm glad to have been here and uh, calling me any time. Just give me a little heads up so I, I can prepare, but I uh, love it. It's, you guys have great questions. Okay, thank thanks you. very much, Catherine. And thank you for listening to The Musical Inner Tube. The Musical Inner Tube is available everywhere good podcasts are found. Listen on your favorite platform and give us a good rating. You can subscribe to the podcast on our website, musicalinnertube.com. There you can listen to all of our podcasts, see pictures and biographies of our guests, and contact us. You could even leave us a voicemail. Hey, and don't forget to leave your email address on our Talk to the Two page on the website, and we'll send you a preview of who's coming to talk with us by email, just so you're prepared. That's musicalintertube.com. And as always, thanks to virtual band Car Radio Dog for our theme music. Music.